today in the auditorium, we'll be looking at simple equations that professional engineers actually use in the early phases of trust design. If you're new to trust design, or if you haven't worked on them in a while, this video is for you. And if you've been finding yourself coming back to this channel and you haven't yet, consider subscribing down below. We'd love to have each and every single one of you join Team Kesteva and join a community of engineers expanding their knowledge from around the world. All right, see you in there. This is not so much an example problem, but kind of a lecture walking through basic equations for uh, preliminary trust design. We need to size this trust and give kind of criteria to the architect or the contractor or the other members of the design team that uh, want to get an idea of, well, how big is this trust going to be uh, dimensionally? Because they need to take that basic info and use it for their own design purposes. This is something that comes up commonly in the professional field. The trust needs to support a roof load and associated environmental loading. That environmental loading criteria might be things like snow, wind, or rain, or a combination of other things that may be on the roof, mechanical units. Those are things that you'd have to think through when you're going through your early phase design, figuring out the loads. That's actually a large portion of time that uh, in the professional world you take and is very important, but there's a disconnect in the academic world where most of the time loading criteria is actually given to you. But for our purposes, we're gonna just keep this example pretty straightforward today. And we're gonna say cumulatively, we have 100 pounds per lineal foot. So if you're working out a preliminary truss size, the first helpful equation is the following. Your span L, as we'll denote it, which in this case is 45 feet, divided by 15 is the approximate depth for a, a generally efficient truss. And so for our case this time, that would mean 45 feet, because L you want to leave in feet, all right? That's the unit you want to leave it in, divided by 15. That would get us an approximate truss depth for a 45 foot span of somewhere around three feet. We can now find the bending moment in our truss. We can calculate our moment and this is not assuming LRFD or ASD or anything like that. This is just pure simplified equations to start with. So you can find the moment, the max uh, bending moment in your truss, M equal to the equation WL squared over eight. W being 100 PLF, L being 45 feet, which gets you 25,312.5 pound feet. Watch your units here. We use PLF and feet, so that's going to give us pound feet. And you know what we're going to do as we move along here? Our equations that are handy, let's highlight as we move along. So, so span L over 15 is your approximate depth of your truss. The next that I would lump into this is your moment equation for uniformly distributed load right here. But remember, this is not specific to actual truss design. It's just the equation used to find um, the maximum bending moment for a simply supported member under a uniform distributed load. And you can find that moment equation in table 3-23 in this manual. With our maximum bending moment calculated in our truss, we can now use that value to solve for our axial loads in our uh, cord members with the following equation. M over D equals P. So in this case, we have 25,312.5 divided by a depth of three feet as we solved for with our first equation. That's going to get us an approximate cord force of 8,437.5 pounds plus dash minus because you have um, a compressive axial force and a tensile axial force. And again, for those that are newer to trusses, you are going to get, if I draw in green here, in your top cord, compressive axial forces, and in your bottom cord, it's gonna be seeing tensile axial forces because that bottom cord is getting stretched as it's uh, deforming and it's pulling away, whereas the top cord is actually shrinking and pushing into itself um, and compressing on itself. Should be most of the time equal and opposite reactions, hence that's where this equation comes from. Um, it's the internal moment arm of the truss itself, but that's not always the case. Again, that's the key here is that this is an approximation. 
So we actually solved in a previous video um, up above there where we had a similar question um, asking for chord forces, but it turned out that that equation wasn't accurate enough to solve for the chord force. This equation sometimes can be a little conservative, so keep that in mind. That equation, m over d is equal to your axial chord forces, is another equation to have in your back pocket when designing preliminary trusses. A great way to remember this equation in particular is actually just to look at its units. So if we come over here, m has pound feet in our problem here, divided by d, which is just the depth of your truss, which is in feet. And when you divide those, that leaves you with p, which from units just breaks down into a pound force. And an axial force is just that, it's just a load. It's in pounds, it's in kips, um, it's in kilonewtons. Uh, I don't know, don't quote me on that last one. I'm here in the US. Next, let's define deflection criteria for our truss. For this example, we are going to define our maximum deflection criteria um, as L over 360. L again being the span of our member, which we said was 45 feet, and then define deflection of a simply supported beam under uniformly distributed load, we have the following equation. Well, what L over 360 equates to is our allowable deflection. And our allowable deflection can also then be substituted in for deflection in the equation that finds your maximum deflection under your loaded condition. In this problem, we are going to assume that we have a steel truss. So for our modulus of elasticity, E is going to be equal to 29 times 10 to the sixth PSI. And as we see, we have the remaining variables in this equation besides our moment of inertia. So now we can rewrite this equation to solve for that moment of inertia. If we bring this over, if we substitute in allowable deflection, L over 360, it's gonna equal five W L to the fourth over 384 EI. If we rearrange this equation by plugging in E, and leaving L as just the variable L, we can rewrite it to solve for I required under the deflection criteria that we specified as L over 360. That gets us an equation of I required equal 1.62 times 10 to the negative seventh WL cubed. Something important to note, W is in PLI, so pounds per linear inch, and L is in the units of inches, okay? You could plug everything in to this equation, totally fine, and pull out your I required, but what we've done is just taken it a step further, and based on the units that I provided here, gives you a slightly easier equation to plug in more quickly. Well, if we scroll down a little bit, and we plug in based on our equation, I required is going to be equal to 1.62 times 10 to the negative seventh W, which is 100 PLF, but we need to get that into PLI. So divide that by 12, because there's 12 inches per foot, multiplied by um, the length of our truss. Again, this is 45 feet, but we need to get that into inches. So 45 times 12 cubed. That gets us an I required under the deflection criteria we we provided of L over 360 equal to 212.57 inches to the fourth. We're gonna scroll back up one more time, I'm gonna go highlighter and I'll highlight this equation for us. This one is a little tricky because it can change based on the units that you're deciding to use. Um, so be very clear with that. If that one is a little too much of a far fetch forward, you can always just continue to use this equation by setting your allowable deflection to your maximum deflection equation and back out an I that way, okay? And lastly, you can take that moment of inertia and you can solve for the required area of your cord of your truss. So let's jump into that right now. So lastly, you can go I required is equal to A D squared over two. D being the depth of your truss, and A being the area of one of your cord members, okay? Not both of them. And again, this is approximate, so if you were to actually do this out, it would get you a slightly different value. 
But again, this is for preliminary design that professionals use to knock out a relative size to give and push the design or the concept design of the, the building envelope forward. So for purposes of our example problem, we have 212, 57 inches to the fourth is equal to A, which we're solving for. D, we know is three feet, but we're gonna use inches. So 36 inches squared over two. That's inches. And then that's inches to the fourth. That's going to give us an area of our cord uh, in inches squared. That is going to equal 0 0.328 inches squared for the amount of steel for your cord. And boom, right there, that's our other handy equation for approximate truss design. We got steel cords. So this right here is a cord. And also at the bottom is a cord. And then here you have your, here we'll give it some volume is your web members, whether diagonals or uh, vertical members. But this gives you the area of one of your cords. And there you have it, the top equations that professional engineers use. What the heck was that? Nah, Joe, I haven't seen Jose anywhere, but I know he's in this auditorium because I hear him here all the time late at night. Find him and get rid of that key that he's got. All right, team, let's get... Okay, so I definitely know Jose's here if he's writing this stuff on my screen. Driving me crazy. That guy sometimes, I wish he'd focus more on his engineering rather than his pranking. This is Rich with Team Kesteva, and I will see everybody next time. Later.